So what I want to talk to you guys today about is pretty much everything I've learned as an operator and an angel investor in startups over the last 14 years in emerging markets, because there are a lot of idiosyncrasies about actually operating in emerging markets and lessons learned that I think could be useful to all of you. Now, what's interesting is I didn't actually set out to, to start operating and angel investing in emerging markets. Um, I'm actually French. I went to the US for college. I went to Princeton, where I studied economics and finished off my class. And then I went to work for McKinsey and Company for a few years. And as a you know, mathematician, consultant, economist, didn't have any brilliant ideas to bring to the world. So I decided to look at which ideas I could bring from the US to my core country, or my home country, which was France. And so I started by building an eBay for France. And so you wouldn't have thought that this introduction leads to operating or investing in emerging markets. But I think, you know, as it happens since happens in life, a year in, I was introduced uh, by a friend of mine from McKinsey to people in Latin America who were thinking of building an eBay for Latin America. And so I went to meet the team in uh, June of 1999, and I told them, look, I've thought through this business before. Let me give you the business plan. Let me give you the technology, and let's go operate. And through this company, which is Deremate, which was later sold to Mercado Libre, which is publicly traded in NASDAQ, I met two very important individuals. One is a, a gentleman called Alec Oxenford, and he's my current uh, co-CEO and co-founder of the startup I run on a day-to-day -day basis, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. And the other one is a gentleman called Jose Marin, who's my co-angel investor in the, in the angel investments we've done around the world. Now, after I, I built Auckland and I sold it, I built uh, a US company doing a reverse arbitrage called Zingy. So I brought a European idea of Jumba to the US market, and that company did actually really well. We went from 1 million in sales in 2002, 5 million in 2003, 50 million in 2004, 200 million in 2005. Yeah, so far, so good. Sold it for 80 million in, um, in, in May of 2004, and started thinking for, through what to do next, and decided to do an arbitrage bringing Craigslist from the US to the rest of the world. Now, I didn't, dis I didn't know where it was going to work. I just knew the idea was good. And there was a clear trend in the world from uh, moving from print classifieds first to paid vertical sites, and then to free horizontal classified sites. And so started looking, um, and you know, the reality is you never know in the world, especially in the internet world, what works and where it works. There's a huge amount of luck. And so we launched OLX with my partner, Alec, in 96 countries in 51 languages. And we opened everywhere, and we figured we'd see what happens. And it just so happens, through, for a number of reasons and a number of factors, that it really took off more in the emerging markets. And so now we're six years later. OLX is the largest classified site in Brazil. We're the largest classified site in India. We're the largest classified site in Pakistan, in Portugal, and pretty much across all of Latin America. We're, we're now even though we started in 96 countries, we're really a company now focused on two countries, which are Brazil and India, and then to a lesser extent, Latin America, uh, Portugal, and Pakistan. And, and, and it has, and, and because we've, we've ended up operating there, it, we've had a lot of lessons that I want to learn or share with you in a few minutes. Now, what's interesting with OLX is currently we're at over 100 million unique visitors a month. This probably puts us in the top 20 sites globally in terms of reach. Now, angel investing, similarly, similarly, I mean, the dark areas are where uh, we've angel invested. You know, because I'm French and I live in New York, we started investing in France and the US. And yet, over the years, because of the networks we'd built, the relationships we'd built, and where we've operated, started investing globally. And today, we've invested in numerous countries from Turkey to Russia to Brazil. And in fact, it's part of the core experience. But I'm not here to tell you what I've done. I'm more here to tell you what I've learned in doing this. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about, about that. So if you look at, first of all, the experience, uh, we've angel invested mostly abroad. So more than 50% of our investments have been abroad. And the only reason the US about 50% is we've decided to focus, we, we, we decided to actually increase our investments there to learn what the new ideas were. And Brazil would actually be higher in that list. It's just that we had four sales or exits recently. 
So these are some examples of companies we've invested in. I mean, Viajanet is an Expedia for, uh, for Brazil. We have ok to go which is a booking.com for Russia. And what's interesting is our very best exits through history have come from emerging markets. And so if you look at our returns, Brazil especially is a candidate for the vast proportion of our returns. I mean, we've, we've had 21 exits, and I'll talk about the performance later, but the very, very best ones have come from emerging markets. Okay, so a few lessons learned. So now this first concept is one that's basically agreed or approved or known by everyone. Ideas that work in one country work in other countries. The human idiosyncrasies in terms of what we want, which is basically to, co to communicate with others, to be entertained, and to have a semblance of meaning in our lives means that ideas that work in one place work in other places. Now, this is a trade, if you want, that's becoming crowded. Many people have realized that this is true. But this is just one example, because if you look at the top business models around the world, they're always the same, basically. You have an auction site, a classified site, a horizontal e-commerce site, and, and, and that's pretty much true everywhere. I could have added China to the list, and it would have been the same thing. You know, the top auction site as Taobao and, um, or, 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 or some of the horizontal classified sites. So it's really the same businesses that have a tendency to become big or the same models that become big everywhere. Now, that's interesting, but not insightful enough in the sense that how you execute and you operate in these markets changes fundamentally. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the idiosyncrasies of the different markets, because it's actually fundamentally different to operate in Brazil, for instance, than it is in Russia. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have covered the differences in payments and logistics, so I'll just gloss over them. But in, 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 in Brazil, for instance, in payments, everything is on an installment basis. So it's fundamentally different from the way it works, let's say, in Russia, where a lot of it is on cash and delivery. Uh, logistics, same thing. In some countries, you have things that work extremely well. Give you a few things that people don't often talk about but make a big difference. Legal differences are, are huge. In the US, the, the sites are never responsible for the actions of their users, especially if you're just a middleman, like in classifieds. But that, and, and there's something called the Digital Copyright Millennium Act. This is not quite yet true and, and hasn't been quite tested legally in many emerging markets. And so often they want to hold the site responsible for the actions of its users, even though we're not directly operating or responsible. Um, to give you specific examples, I mean, differently, in Brazil, Brazil is a very litigious country. People will sue you just because they can. It's, it's basically free to sue. And so 99%, I think 95% of the lawsuits we have at OLX are from Brazil. And they're all frivolous. It, it, we had nothing to do with, with whatever issue happened. And yet, because we're the richer party, they name us. And so we spend a lot of time defending ourselves. Uh, there are fundamental labor differences. In, we had, in my first company, in Zingy, in my last US company, one of our employees actually forged checks. She, she wrote my name, she signed with my name, and she wrote herself checks. And when we found out, we, we called the police, uh, obviously, and the police came, arrested her in the company, and took her to jail, and that was done. We had a case of that in, in Argentina where we have 200 employees. One of our employees committed fraud. We documented the fraud. We proved she was stealing money from the company. We reported her to the police. They did nothing. Even worse, we're not even allowed to fire the person. And to me, it's like insane. It's like, this is a thief, someone that we do not want anywhere near us. And because of the labor laws, we're not even able to do something about it. And so the very, the very details of how you operate and what are the idiosyncrasies of different countries matter a lot. The, another example is supplier quality fundamentally differs. I mean, in the US, your suppliers are going to, in real time, give you their inventory uh, via XML. If something sells, boom, they notify you in real time. In, in, many, in Russia, often you're going to sell the right product and, ooh, they already sold it and they just didn't update it. And so all of a sudden, your fulfillment rate falls to 50%. So your buyers are unhappy or your customers are unhappy, your customer acquisition costs just doubled because you thought you sold something and you didn't. I mean, the very details uh, of how these various components work in the different countries matter fundamentally. A few other lessons. Um, globalization is, you know, people keep talking about how the world is globalizing, globalizing. 
it's a much more fragile thing than you can imagine. Only 20% of venture capital is happening cross-border. The only 2% of, uh, of students who are born in one country go and study in a different country for college. Only 3% of people live in a country other than the one they live in. And that means that there are still a lot of things that are native to a country. And by the way, it also means there are a lot of opportunities or ideas that you can take from one country to another country because people are just not aware that, the, that these opportunities actually exist. And so uh, taking a global perspective really opens up a lot of opportunities. And, and linked to that, capital, especially when it comes to emerging markets, is very fickle. Sometimes a country gets hot and it's very easy to, to raise three, four, five, six, seven million in, in, in venture money. But for the most part, it's not true. For the most part, these days, it's easy to get seed money. It's easy to get late stage growth money if you make it, but getting series A money is really hard. And which countries are hot differs widely. I mean, a few years ago, both Russia and Brazil were really hot for venture capitalists. Today, it's harder to get venture money in, in, in those markets on average. Uh, Turkey and maybe Indonesia are becoming hotter today than they were recently. And so, things or circumstances actually change uh, pretty rapidly. And given that investors have a tendency to all follow you know, the same trends, think it, it has real consequences in terms of how capital efficient you need to make your company. The last thing but probably to mention or focus on in, in emerging markets is you know, most exits, first of all, most exits in the world are below 30 million, but it's especially true in emerging markets because in emerging markets, multiples have a tendency to be lower. And that means if you're going to be an entrepreneur and you're going to be an operator, you need to be very thoughtful about how, you, how much money you raise, what valuation you raise, and how capital efficient the company you build is. And often it's going to take a lot longer than you think to actually get a business going. So the consequences of this. Well, first, there are clear hiring consequences. If I'm hiring someone that, that you can't fire, um, it, it means you need to trust them a lot more. Moreover, if, if, if things don't work easily, you need people that are more experienced. In the US, many of the entrepreneurs we back are 23 years old. They're 24 years old. And the reason is, if you want to launch an e-commerce company in the US, well, you don't need to know anything about logistics. You have these 3PL, these third-party logistics companies that, do, that handle it for you. Your suppliers are really smart. They can drop ship or do consignment shipping. You don't need to take any inventory. You, you don't need to think, so you don't need to think at all about inventory management, supply chain management, logistics. All this happens automatically. So if you're a 24-year-old founder in the US launching an e-commerce company, you need to think about which vertical you're going for, what your merchandising strategy is going to be, and your innovative marketing strategy. In Russia, this is not true. In Russia, your supplier, you're going to have to take inventory. You may even need to build a warehouse. You're going to need to take care of your delivery yourself or your payments yourself. And so the average age of the founders is much higher. We, we typically back founders who are in their late 20s or early 30s who have prior operating experience, who've been to business school. They were at Harvard or GSB. And it's a very different profile because you need that experience. If you don't have it, you're much, much, much more likely to, to fill in, in emerging markets than you are in the US. Now, it also means you need to put controls in place in the way you run your company that are different from the way you run it in, in, in let's say, the US. In, in the, our auditors did not catch the thief in, um, in, in Argentina. We did because we were extraordinarily vigilant to the way, to the way things were run. Um, it also means you need very, very, very capital efficient. The first seed money is going to be available, but the follow-on capital is not going to be there. And so you need to be very thoughtful about how much money you raise, and you want to keep valuations low, both as an investor, but frankly, as an entrepreneur. As an entrepreneur, you would think, ooh, dilution matters. If I can raise five million at 10 pre, I should do it. But the reality is, if you can raise two million at four pre, you might actually be better off. And the reason you might be better off is, if you get an exit for 10 million, you're gonna, everyone's gonna be happy. Your investor's gonna be happy, you're gonna be happy. If you do raise five at 10 and you sell for 10, you're not gonna make any money because the liquidation preference is gonna take it all. So all that said, uh, Jose and I, as angel investors, have defined a strategy to operate in light of these, consequ of, of these consequences. So the strategy we defined is as follows. For, we're not going to take both business model risk and market risk. So we'll do innovative ideas in the US, 
but in the rest of the world, we'll only do copies. Now, I said before, that trade of copies is, is, is being or arbitraged away. There are many more people doing it, but we only do ideas that have already reached 100 million in, in revenues, so they're much more proven, and that are profitable, and we typically bring our secret sauce in execution. Ideas matter a lot less than execution, and here, our operational expertise in terms of getting you to scale matters a lot. We, we only invest because angel investing is something we do at part-time at night. We only invest in models that we can evaluate very rapidly. So we only do consumer-facing companies in marketplaces, e-commerce, and travel, where literally we can decide instinctively whether or not this is a good idea, and then we can decide in one hour whether or not we like the team. We only invest in large markets. So historically, we've done the US, Brazil, Russia, Germany, and the UK. And now we're starting to look at places like Turkey, and we're thinking about India and Indonesia as well. So to talk about the, the portfolio strategy, I mean, given how head-driven the world is, and given how much luck there is, we've changed our investment strategy. We, when we started investing, we invested in a few companies per year. Last year, we invested in 35 companies and did 10 follow-ons. This year, we're in 16 companies and seven follow-ons. I mean, basically, we've invested in over 103 companies. And despite the fact that it feels like spray and pray, because we have the process I described before, the strategy we described before, and the process I'm about to describe, it's actually worked reasonably well. Now, the way we source deals is reasonably unique. So we source deals because we've already backed 200 entrepreneurs. So very often they come back to us for the next, uh, for the next time they want to do a company. They introduce us to their friends. And we've identified the top entrepreneurs, especially for foreign markets or emerging markets, at the top US business schools. And as, they, as they're in business school, we either take them in interns or we listen to their ideas and we, and we prep them to fund them or back them once they finish business school and they go back to Turkey or Russia uh, or Brazil. We also work with a lot of angels globally. I mean, Shem, who's here for Turkey, for instance, is right here. We have uh, uh, Brent Oberman and ProFounders in, in the UK. And we, have a, and we work with a lot of um, established VCs. I mean, DN Capital, uh, Index, Axel, General Catalyst, et cetera. Now, the way we evaluate, um, so we have a strategy. They, the people have come in, it's a consumer-facing company. They're going after a large market. They come from a trusted source. And now we, we have to decide, do we like this? Do we want to write them a check? And so we literally will decide in one hour. And the way we do it is, do we like the team? Do we like the product? Does the idea meet our nine business election criteria plus the tenth, which is we want the idea to be live and, and, the business, and, and some unit economics to be understood in early traction, and do we like the deal terms? And literally, if we like all four, we will say we are committed. That doesn't mean you leave with a check. I mean, we're writing 50 to 100K checks in as part of a half a million, a million dollar rounds, but if you can get the rest of the money, and when you send us the details of the deal terms, if it actually matches what we think is fair and reasonable, we're in. And that ability to decide rapidly, especially given that we do this part-time, I mean, this is not our full-time job and will not be our full-time job. My partner, Jose, is a co-CEO of his company, IG Expansion. I'm co-CEO of OLX, and that's not changing. You know, it's actually made a big difference. I've learned a lot that when you're making decisions, Taking more time does not actually help you make or take a better decision. It's much more important that, that your process and, and the mechanism by which you make the decisions are, are informed, uh, and then, and then you, you go with it. So performance today, this is not my performance for those who've been looking or tracking the performance of the entire portfolio, including the companies I've run. This is purely my performance as an angel investor. So invested in 103 companies, deployed 6.6 .6 million, uh, sold 21 companies, 14 where I made money, seven where I lost money, some, complete, some I lost it all, some I got part of it back. For these 21, invested 1.6 million and got a, a bit over 9 million out. So the strategy seems to work you know, reasonably well. And because it works really well, I think it, has, it entails that a lot of the lessons that I've learned as an angel, the corollary or the opposite is can be relevant for you guys as, as, as entrepreneurs. Now, what's interesting is we're actually thinking of changing it uh, because there are clear global trends. I mean, mo mobile is becoming a bigger part of the world. And in the emerging markets, it's often mobile first and might even be mobile only. And we haven't done anything in mobile. 
And so we're going to tweak it at the margin, but for the most part, we're going to be following this strategy going forward. And it's worked really, really well. So we still have 83 companies in the portfolio. Uh, last round valuation, they're worth about 10 million. And ho this is just my numbers. Jose's numbers are basically identical, uh, if, if not even better. So that's basically it.